Good evening. Uh, I was asked to say uh, some personal impressions on the accelerating universe, um, which seems a bit challenging. And I, and I, but, I, but I found myself remembering, um, this is myself as a, as a, uh, as a graduate student, um, uh, talking uh, in, in a conversation with a, very, a good close friend of mine, who was my only friend who was a, uh, in physics, uh, both undergraduate and graduate, with me um, in, in school. And I remember um, having a, a, you know, expressing my real concerns uh, that I wasn't sure I'd be able to find a topic for, for a research project um, that would you know, fit my, what I was really wanting to do. I really wanted to get something that was very deep, fundamental, felt sort of um, almost philosophical about how the world works and do it as a, as a just practical physics um, project. And, uh, and I, I didn't know what I was going to happen. I thought maybe we just all end up choosing some problem and just working with whatever it was. And then I, within just a couple of years, I was lucky enough that I came across the perfect problem uh, for, for this. Um, it was the question of, you know, what is the fate of the universe? And, uh, and, <laughs> I, and you know, even, even better, it, it, it came along with another problem, which is, is the universe infinite or finite? I mean, what could be better? Even just the, the words have capital letters in them you know, when, when you say the questions. And, um, and so I, I, I loved the fact that I was able to actually start a project that, I, that was exactly what I always wanted to do, that I, that I really cared about. Um, now, I, I think it might be worth just describing why is it even possible to make just a practical measurement um, that would tell you something like what is the fate of the universe. And, uh, and so let me, let me try to describe uh, of, of what, you know, what that meant. And it begins with the, uh, with the idea that we've known since the time of Hubble, back in 1930-ish, um, that the universe is expanding. And when I say that, you should immediately be puzzled, and, and, and your mind should already start uh, to be boggled, because uh, you start asking, well, what could a universe be expanding into? And uh, so I always sort of stop and say, well, OK, what we mean by expanding universe isn't what it sounds like. You're supposed to imagine a sort of infinite universe. This is my attempt at drawing an infinite universe. Um, these are supposed to be galaxies, and you're supposed to imagine that if I could draw better, I would have an infinite number of galaxies going on forever that way, and down to the floor, and into the board, and out towards you. And this is a cartoon universe, of course. The only thing that matters is that there's an average distance between the galaxies. And when I say that the universe is, is expanding, all I mean is that all the distances are just getting a little bit bigger. And, and, and that's all I mean by expanding universe. Um, nothing is going in, going, expanding into anything else. Or if anything, we're sort of pumping space in between all the points in the universe. And that's what we, the way we picture an, an expanding universe. Um, but with that one simple picture of an expanding universe, you immediately start asking questions. And, and people did since the time of Hubble. Like, um, well, that, will that go on forever? Um, can't you imagine that maybe it might be slowing down because you'd expect that each of these galaxies would gravitationally attract all the other galaxies, and that would slow the expansion? And could someday the universe come to a halt? Could it be the, an end? And so that turns this from a uh, sort of abstract philosophical question into a practical question we can measure. The reason that that actually became possible uh, just around the time when I was worrying about what project to do is because we discovered that there was a kind of exploding star, a kind of supernova, um, which we understood in a new way. Um, these supernova are really, really bright. And, uh, and this one exploding star can, uh, when just for those few weeks while it, it blows up and, and it brightens and fades away, can be brighter than the entire 100 billion, gal a billion stars in the same galaxy as that star is found. So they're tremendously bright. You can see them at vast distances. And what was wonderful about this one recognition that there was a certain kind of supernova that you could recognize is that that kind of supernova acted as a standard candle. It always reached about the same brightness and then faded away. So you could tell how far away it was by just looking at how faint it looked. And so it was very easy to know exactly how far away you were looking every time you saw one of these supernovae explode. But in astronomy, when you look far away, you're actually looking back in time. And that's just based on that simple idea that light takes time to travel to you. Now, it doesn't sound like much, but when you think about it from the astronomical perspective, and when you realize how far these, these exploding stars could be seen, you're actually talking about something rather interesting. So let me just walk through a little bit of that. Um, the sun is not that far away, um, but the light still is taking eight minutes to travel to us. If the sun were to go out, we wouldn't know about it for eight minutes. Then we'd, no, we'd notice. You know. the, you know, uh, skipping past the, the nearest star, the nearest galaxy of stars um, is uh, much further away. Now we're looking at light. The, all the light that we're seeing here left those stars 150,000 years ago. So here on Earth, at the time when that light left those stars, it was, it was the first evidence of human culture on Earth. That's my attempt at drawing human culture. The, 
nearest galaxy cluster, in other words, that's a congregation of galaxies of stars, is much further away. Now we're looking at um, this light that left these stars some 65 million years ago. So here on Earth, at that time, the, the dinosaurs were going extinct. And even that distance, yeah, my, my extinct dinosaur, and even that distance um, is nothing compared to the most distant um, uh, exploding star that we can see. So the, the, the supernova that we've seen that's the most distant is about, uh, the light's been traveling to us for 10 billion years. So there's a historical event that only lasted for you know, a few weeks and that we now know about 10 billion years later as light reaches us. I, I mean, it's just amazing. But that means now that we can ask questions about, well, what's the universe been doing for the past 10 billion years? And in particular, um, has it been slowing down? And has it been slowing down enough um, so that someday it might come to a halt? And is there enough stuff to gravitationally slow it? So that's something that um, you, the one other thing you need to know is you need to know if you found these spots at different points in history, how much has the universe expanded since that time in history? It turns out there's a really convenient trick. The supernova's color tells us the answer to that one. And uh, to give you a sense of this, we, we call this the redshift of the supernova. Uh, but let me just show you how it really works. Um, the supernova explodes in some distant galaxy over here. And it looks, uh, mo a supernova, if you could stand up close and, and not die, would, would look blue. And so that's a, a short wavelength of light. And then the light starts to travel to us in an expanding universe. And in an expanding universe, anything that's not nailed down expands just with the universe. And that includes the very wavelengths of light that I'm talking about. So that blue light starts to stretch with the universe as it travels to us. And by the time we see it, it looks reddish. And how red it looks tells you exactly how much the universe has stretched since the time. And you know that time because you know how bright the supernova is and how far back you must be looking. So it's the most direct, simple experiment that I know of to get at something incredibly deep, which is you know, what's the fate of the universe? So uh, we, we got to work on this. It, um, we uh, had to use the biggest telescopes in the world. It's a whole other story. I'll tell you all about that someday if you're curious. Um, you, uh, you, you had to look through thousands and thousands of galaxies to find these exploding stars. They're pretty rare. Um, and the galaxies are these little faint blue specks in this picture, not these bright, garish things. Um, it's these, these little faint blue things are the galaxies you have to search through to find a new speck of light. That's the supernova. It's a really tough job to find them. So a lot of the earlier work was computer um, image analysis that allowed us to have the computer home in on this little patch here and show us the new light that's there that wasn't there three weeks earlier. If you subtract this image from this image, you see just the light of the supernova. And if you were able to see this from space, as we later were able to, you actually can pick out the little spot that's the supernova in the background smudge that's the galaxy. And the here on Earth, they all get blurred together. So we developed those techniques. And um, by, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you about that later. But eventually, we got up to, we had 42 supernova in hand. And, we were, and it seemed like an auspicious number to, to study the fate of the universe, for those of you who uh, read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And uh, we were ready to plot them on this plot of the fate of the universe. You know, uh, what is the average distance between galaxies as a function of time? And the options were great. One option was that the universe would slow and slow, but expand forever. And just to give you a feel what that would look like, um, you imagine that you're lying on your back, and I guess you have telescopes for eyes. And you look out, and you see everything expanding away from each other and away from you. And it's going on and on forever, but slower and slower. So that was option one. Option two was a little bit more dramatic. There, the universe slows to a halt, and then turns over and collapses, and comes to an end. That was going to be more exciting. That one uh, begins, it looks the same at the beginning. So it expands and slows and slows to a halt. And then it starts turning around and coming back in at you. And you start to feel a little nervous at this stage. And this, this universe really comes to an end. And so that was option two. I mean, you, so we were going to get to plot a plot and see where the supernova fell is on this line, on this line. And we get to find out the fate of the universe by just but, you know, just measuring the, the brightness and colors of these supernova. It was great. And it turned out that we, we looked to see which, the, which answer was the answer, and the answer was that. It was, <laughs> so the universe is apparently not slowing down at all. It's just going whoosh. And uh, you know, pretty soon it'll just accelerate, take off. And I've been telling the funding agencies that you have to fund us now, because we only have a few more billion years. <laughs> we won't be able to see these things for very long. So, so this was. This is what we, what we saw. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's the best possible result for a scientist, right? Because either result would have been great. And we got neither of those. We got something even better, a mystery, a surprise. We have no idea why the universe is, is speeding up. 
what is going on? And, uh, and, and just to show this to you in, in, in what the real data looked like, um, so you know, the, the supernova we started to plot, their brightness tells you how far back in time you're looking. Their redshift, how blue to red, tells you how uh, much the average distance between the galaxies is, is shifting. The data points all missed all the predicted lines here. And we're apparently on this universe that used to be slowing in the past, but it's now accelerating. And this was something that was actually seen simultaneously at Berkeley twice. There was two competing groups by the end of this project that were racing to get this result. And within months of each other, um, they, there was uh, two, two different exclamation marks going on. Um, we, our group was, headed, uh, was working uh, mostly up at the hill uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory um, with the grad students from Berkeley. And there was another group that was working down the hill. And the two groups were both seeing th this result simultaneously. And I don't think that it's just a coincidence that we ended up with this Berkeley view of the cosmos. Um, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll explain what I mean. First, we, I, I should say that we still do not know um, what's going on. Um, we're calling it dark energy. If it really is an energy that pervades all of space, it makes up almost three quarters of the stuff of the universe, and we've never seen it before. We don't know what it is. So it's a, it's a great project, and everybody's you know, diving into this and ever since then and trying to figure out what's going on. It could be even worse. It could be that it's not a new energy, that we actually have to change Einstein's theory of general relativity um, that, you know, that would be even more dramatic, if possible. Um, and so it's a, we're, we're on to a great project. Um, all right, so is, is it just a coincidence that um, it, this happened at Berkeley twice and the, the Nobel Prize you know, is what, uh, the, this was what the Nobel Prize was for? Um, and I, I think the answer is no. I think um, there, there are a few <laughs> things about, about Berkeley, aside from the parking spaces, that I think have made it um, a, a, a very fertile place for, for this kind of work. And, and first, I'll, des I'll describe that uh, when, I, when I came to Berkeley, um, I was coming much, you know, much attracted to the tradition of, uh, and, and the, the, the amazing breadth of experimental capability at Berkeley, that there were people in almost any area you want to work in, we had the experts here. And if, there weren't, if the experts weren't down the hill, they were up the hill at the National Laboratory, which was so tightly integrated with the, with the uh, university. And uh, so it was like the best place to come and do an a, uh, experiment uh, research project. And, but there was something beyond that, um, what, which I discovered when I came to Berkeley, which is that it's not just that all these things exist. It's that there's a, this, this amazing culture at Berkeley and how people work together, um, on, in, in, at least in the sciences as I saw it, um, which is this amazingly non-hierarchical uh, a culture where anybody's idea is, is welcomed, and that the young people in, the, in these groups, um, as, as, as a, young, uh, a, a young, even graduate student postdoc, you know, I already had the, the elder, you know, much more capable people uh, listening to me in this picture. <laughs> and, um, but you can see it, it replicated all over the university, and, and I think it's really um, something that is a, a sort of a different spirit um, that, that you see here. Uh, and in some ways, it actually feels like it, it, it reflects very well uh, you know, so, something that California br brought to the table um, and, and may also um, tie in a little bit to, uh, today to the, to the Hewitt um, story, um, because I think the, uh, there is this uh, tradition of, uh, that people still talk about of the HP way in which uh, research was done um, in the Silicon Valley days, early days um, as, as well, which had this very non-hierarchical hunt for what good ideas are out there and who can work together on what. And then it's also, I think, um, something which is, is very important about um, what the chairs uh, um, are providing that, that we're celebrating today, that they're providing th this extra room for that kind of time and space for people to work together in, in this way. And so it feels like it's very appropriate to, to tell the story uh, today to, the, to this group. I, and I wanted to finish with one extra element, which I think something like the extra time and space that's allowed, that these chairs allow, is, is, uh, is important for. And that's that this work that I was describing struck us as really hard to do uh, when we started the project. We thought it was going to be a three-year experiment, a three-year project, and, uh, and we set off to, to work on it. Three years in, we had not found a single one of these distant supernova. Six years in, we figured out, we'd found a couple supernova, and we figured out how to do the project. Nine years in, we had collected the data. By 10 years, we had actually gotten the result. And you know, on, almost any ordinary way of dealing with science and, and funding and things like that, you, know, you say, OK, you had your three years. It, you, you gave your, you know, your best shot at it. It didn't work. You know, you're done. Um, but there's something about the extra br breathing room to try a difficult problem, which I think is so important to remember. because. You know, many, many problems in this world are not problems that can be solved um, the first time around. 
and they take that, that ability and, that, and the support that, you know, that a place, a, a institutions like, like this can provide to allow that extra try and that extra try until you get to it. If it's an important problem, you, you, you should be willing to spend 10 years solving it. None of us were disappointed that that's how we spent our 10 years. And I think there are many problems in the world, even outside of science, where I think none of us will feel disappointed if we make progress on them in more than 10 years. So let me, let me finish with that thought. And, uh, and thank you again for, uh, for the organization here. <laughs>